Wars are bad for business, but good for defense stocks. The outperformance of global defense stocks since the start of the Biden presidency says a lot about the direction of U.S. foreign policy under Biden's watch. Why is the 2024 election about what America will do with the broken Pax Americana? Why is the second Biden term bullish for defense stocks and the U.S. dollar, while the opposite will be true under a second Trump term? Global defense stocks are off to a strong start in 2024. The global defense benchmark MSCI World Aerospace and Defense Index is up more than 9% so far this year, beating the 7% return of the world stock market. This performance is especially impressive considering the 26% drop of the stock price of Boeing that was the largest constituent of the index. U.S. foreign policy is the biggest driver of the performance of defense stocks. It says a lot about U.S. foreign policy under Joe Biden's presidency that global defense stocks have gone up 54% since its inauguration versus a 16% return of the world stock market. To compare, under Trump, global defense stocks went up less in the world stock market more. The sharp contrast in both the absolute and relative performance of defense stocks between the Biden and the Trump presidency should not be a surprise. Whereas today the world is edging ever closer to World War III, Trump was the first U.S. president since Jimmy Carter who didn't send U.S. troops into new conflicts. U.S. foreign policy under Biden and Trump could not have been any more different. In this respect, we can safely assume that the outcome of the 2024 U.S. election will have a huge impact on both global geopolitical risk as well as on the performance of defense stocks. Global defense spending went up by 9% in 2023, reaching $2.2 trillion. However, as a share of GDP, military expenditure is still pretty low by recent historical standards. In 2022, military expenditure was just 2.3% of world GDP, not far from the low of 2.1% reached in 2018. Since 1960, global military expenditure as a share of world GDP has gone down significantly. Even the massive U.S. defense buildup in the early 1980s under Ronald Reagan ultimately had the effect of lowering global military expenditure after it helped bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union and an end to the Cold War. Between 1960 and 2000, military expenditure fell from 6.5% to just 2.2% of world GDP. The reduction in defense spending brought great economic benefits. Countries had more money to spend more on healthcare, education, and infrastructure. There is an extensive literature documenting the negative relationship between defense spending and economic growth. A recent study examining 133 countries during the 1960 and 2012 period indicated that a decrease in military expenditure to GDP ratio of just one percentage point increases economic growth by 1.1 percentage points. The United States, the biggest spender on defense in the world, was the primary beneficiary of the peace dividends that came with the end of the Cold War. U.S. military expenditure fell from 6.6% of GDP in 1986 to just 3.1% by 1999. The 1990s, also known as the Roaring 90s in the U.S., were marked by above-average GDP growth, low inflation, and a U.S. budget surplus by the end of the decade. In Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes described the state of nature as a condition of war of every man against every man. Existence in the state of nature is, as Hobbes famously said, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. While war is the norm and peace the exception in human history, there have been some periods of relative peace and prosperity. One such period was the 200 years between the accession of the Roman Emperor Augustus 
and the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180 AD that is commonly referred to as the Pax Romana. Augustus integrated the newly conquered territories into the empire, reformed the tax system, built an extensive network of roads across the empire, expanded the Roman coinage, and tirelessly promoted trade and commerce. No doubt there were revolts and wars, and as one unhappy Briton said, they create desolation and call it peace. But under the Pax Romana, the Roman Empire reached a period of relative stability and prosperity. Some historians call the period between the end of the Second World War and today as the Pax Americana. Like Pax Romana, Pax Americana is also a hegemonic piece, meaning the result of the emergence of a single great power. Under Pax Americana, the U.S. leverages its dominant military and economic power to support friendly governments, to promote economic liberalization, and to spread American principles of liberty and democracy. American hegemony has been accompanied by an unprecedented prosperity in the world, brought on by faster productivity growth, wider diffusion of technology, and poverty reduction. Thomas Hobbes believed human beings are driven only by self-interest. It is no different for countries. Pax Americana made sense as long as it served the interests of the United States. In many ways, the 2024 U.S. election is foremost about whether Pax Americana still serves the interests of the U.S., and if it doesn't, what America is going to do about it. If Pax Americana is supposed to serve the interests of the U.S., its most important unintended consequence is its facilitation of the emergence of China as a major rival to the U.S. The central tenets of the so-called Washington Consensus are privatization, open trade, and capital account liberalization. China listened to the advice, made some adjustments, and became an economic juggernaut. Today, with China as the biggest threat to American hegemony, the U.S. suffering from buyer's regret. In an interview last week, Janet Yellen, U.S. Treasury Secretary, admitted that for many years she had viewed the surge in Chinese exports as a positive development, providing low-cost goods to American consumers. But then cheap Chinese goods hollow out the U.S. manufacturing base, leaving millions of Americans out of work and fueling a political backlash to globalization. Yellen, who taught economics at Berkeley, said that economists used to think that if people send you cheap goods, you should send them a thank you note. She said in an interview that she didn't think that anymore. Indeed, she's in China this week to tell the Chinese to stop subsidizing its green energy products. Pax Americana is broken. Where Trump and Biden differ, is what to do about it. Biden wants to fix it. His foreign policy is calibrated to revive American hegemony by strengthening U.S. alliances while weakening China and its allies. Over the past three years, Biden has redoubled the U.S. commitment to NATO, signed a new trilateral security partnership with Australia and the U.K., and pursued a three-way peace deal between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S. Meanwhile, he's also imposed unprecedented technology sanctions on China and pushed Ukraine into a war with China's most important ally, Russia. Biden's aggressive push to restore Pax Americana is the reason why defense spending has risen sharply worldwide and why defense stocks are doing so well. The goal of restoring Pax Americana means Biden cannot afford to allow Russia to win the war in Ukraine not after he sent $75 billion worth of economic and military aid to Ukraine since the start of the war. Given how far Biden has taken the U.S. into this war, including blowing up Nord Stream 2, according to Seymour Hersh, a Russian victory would be a huge blow to American prestige and credibility. We should thus assume that if Biden is re-elected, we will likely see a further increase in U.S. and NATO involvement in the Ukraine war. My guess is that Biden will double down. This means a second Biden term should be viewed as very bullish for defense stocks. And bullish for the dollar too, or else been equal. 
Given America is far away from the theater of the war, an escalation of the war in Ukraine should help support the greenback, especially versus European currencies. How will defense stocks perform in a second Trump term? Probably not very well. Trump has promised to end the Ukraine war in one day if he's re-elected. If he succeeds, it will mean the end of the gravy train for the defense contractors. Whilst Biden promises to defend Taiwan against the Chinese invasion, Trump is non-committal. This means a second Biden term will help embolden the minority pro-independence camp in Taiwan, whereas a second Trump term will give them pause. You don't have to be a game theorist to see that oil has been equal. China will have less of an incentive to make a preemptive move on Taiwan under a second Trump term. In the Middle East, a second Trump term will see Iran's oil revenue turn off and its war chest drain. This will weaken Iran's many proxies and slow down the arms race in the region. By the end of his first term, Trump had a poor relationship with the military leadership and defense contractors. In September 2020, Trump mounted a major public attack on the defense complex, accusing his military leadership of advocating war so that all those wonderful companies that make the bombs, make the planes, and make everything else stay happy. I think we should take for granted that many in the powerful defense establishment will be loath to see Trump return as the commander-in-chief. I don't know what they would do to stop him, but the fact that some of these people wrongly view Trump as the biggest threat to Pax Americana makes me think that the market is not pricing the political risk premium associated with this election high enough. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in my investment strategy, come check us out at davidwuunbound.com.